the ones that have loud voices. All right. Welcome to week four, lecture three. Pretty soon we're all going to get confused about what week it is and what lecture we're supposed to be on. But this week, uh, I'm going to start talking about conceptual diagramming and maybe physical diagramming afterwards. Uh, if you remember from the first lecture that we had, we talked about the three kinds of diagramming that are most used in database design. There's conceptual, logical, and physical. Logical and physical are essentially the same thing, except one has defined data types, one does not. That's the big difference. Uh, conceptual is where it all starts. This is the diagramming type you use to um, high-level thinking. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the modeling, although some of these objectives are actually moot point because we covered it already, but they'll be brought up as we go through. Um, how the process works, and we'll describe how to actually recognize some of this. stuff. So you guys, if you've already done lab three, some of this will feel familiar. Just we're out of sync a little bit because of how the lecture is a week behind. But anyways, there's, that's life. We all got to suck it up and grin and bear it. Okay, for starters, the database model, which I touched on the first lecture, is uh, a database can be modeled as either a collection of entities or a series of relationships between entities. And they are essentially the same thing. Um, a collection of entities is a group of related objects. And a relationship defines how they're interconnected with each other. Um, the most common diagramming method is called an entity relationship diagram, known as an ER diagram, or as people get lazier and lazier, they're now known as an ERD, entity relationship diagram. And it's basically the blueprint of how the structure of the database is. And it's just like um, when you're designing like a house, at first, you get the concept drawings, where you know it sketches out what it's going to look like roughly. You know, you might get the person actually takes time to color it in and maybe render it in 3D, so you have an idea of what they think the vision of the house is. And then there's the actual blueprints that they design that they give to the construction guys. So, conceptual diagramming is the part where you're drawing the picture of the house to give an idea of what it should look like. Now, there's the word speaking of sketching. Uh, it allows us to sketch, a, an ER diagram lets us sketch the design. It's a graphical tool because you're dealing with pictures, essentially. You're drawing a diagram. Um, they're used everywhere. And basically put, no matter where you work, you're going to come across some ERDs. And like I said, there's a couple of different kinds of ERDs. And we deal with two in this course. Um, and essentially, it's a model slash diagram that identifies the concepts the database has to do with, and how things are interconnected. That's their pur its purpose in life. Um, I could actually go into a lot more detail talking about who came up with the concepts of ERDs and the different flavors that have gone through over the years. It's not going to help you learn how to do it now, so I'm, I'm skipping the history lesson. I actually cut out about five slides out of this a couple of years ago just because it was all history lessons. And I suddenly realized I was just wasting everybody's time. So. If you really want to know the history, go Wikipedia. There's like a 16-page like a article on ERDs <laughs> that talks about who came up with them and, you know, Cod and Chen and those guys. So an ERD serves specific purposes. Um, it allows the designer to better understand the information that's supposed to be contained in the database. Um, as, as you start doing the, diag the initial diagram, you start doing the initial design, it helps you understand what's actually happening with the data in the database, like what it is. Um, it is a documentation tool. And one of the things you're going to learn once you go out into the field, one of the very most important things you're ever going to have is documentation. If you're coming into a project with no documentation, you're going to hate your life. You're going to hate your coworkers. You're going to hate your employer. You're going to hate your, cu your customers. Because then you have no, you're working in a void. Um, imagine like you're like getting a, the last assignment for Java on the first day of class. And they say, make this happen, and you have no idea where to even start. That's what it's like programming without documentation, because you're literally working in a void, and you have no idea what the heck's actually supposed to happen. Documentation provides that. And the ERD, depending which one you're, you're talking about, is also a way to explain to the customer how you see their data. 
the conceptual diagram is very end user friendly. And by end user, I'm talking about the person that signs your checks or the customer that gives the money to the person that signs your checks. As you can see, I'm always coming back to money because that's what it's all about, right? We work for money. Our employers work for money to, so they can pay us and make a profit too, that kind of stuff. And the conceptual ERDs is the best tool to explain to your customer how you understand their data. Because it's very high level, there's not a lot of details in it. It's easier for them to understand what you grasp. And then once everybody's happy, then you can move on to the more detailed versions. And then at that point, odds are the, the, the customers aren't going to be involved anymore at that point as the developers. So when you talk about an ERD, there's four components. There's entities, relationship, the cardinality, and sometimes the attributes. The entity is you know, a thing. The relationship is how the things are interconnected. The cardinality has to do with the rules of how they're connected. And the attributes is if you choose to de describe in more detail this thing. So just as a quick refresher from relationships last week, there's, a few, there's two kinds of relationships. There's an optional relationship and a mandatory relationship. An optional relationship, for example, would be an employee may or may not be assigned to a department or a patient may or may not be assigned to a bed. If anybody's ever been to the hospital recently, you know you may or may not be assigned to a bed. You may be assigned to a bed in the hallway temporarily for like 22 hours, but you may or may not be assigned to a bed. Um, on the other hand, a mandatory relationship is one that must be enforced. For example, a course must be taught by a teacher. Even if you take an online course where you don't see a teacher, there was actually a teacher somewhere involved in creating that course. And there is somebody grading those assignments, even if it's an online course. That means there is a, still a teacher for that course. And the, I, I got to fix this because it's backwards. Every child has to have at least a mother. And I screwed it up when I typed it in. And every year I look at the slide and I say, I got to fix it. And then I go home and I forget to fix it. Uh, but every child must have a mother. Obviously not. Well, actually, technically, to be a mother, you have to have a child. So every mother must have at least one child. Otherwise, you're not a mother. So let's go with the political correctness on that. But essentially, it's a must to be this. Or a course must have a teacher to be taught. Otherwise, there's n that's not going to work. Okay. Cardinality. Again, another quick review from last week. It's the number of entities involved or instances involved in the relationship. Um, so essentially, there's a minimum cardinality and a maximum cardinality. And the minimum is, if the minimum is zero, that means it's optional. If it's at least one, then it's mandatory. Or if it's one or more, then it's mandatory. And the maximum cardinality is whatever the maximum number may be. Most database servers do not enforce an actual maximum. It just says, you're allowed to have one or more of this. I mean, you know how dumb it would be to say, oh, this relationship, you're only ever allowed to have five orders. A customer can only ever have five orders. After five, they're not allowed to order anymore. Honestly, that's, that's a stupid rule, right? So it'd be, they're allowed, an order, a customer has to at least have one order. They can have as many as they want. So that's the maximum. So I've covered these last week, one-to-one, -one, one to many and then the, uh, the Kentucky edition, the many-to-many. -many. I'm not covering that again. But now I'm going to talk about the symbol symbols. So the first symbol at the top is mandatory one. As you can see, there's two lines, chunk, chunk. So these two symbols, you read it from left to right or from the inside of the line to the outside of the line. So if the, if the spot in the middle here is the inside of the line, wherever it connects to the other one is the outside of the line. So from the inside, it tells you the minimum. A straight line means mandatory. There must be at least one. If it's a circle, that means it's zero. It's optional. The second symbol, if it's another line, this means it's one and only one and must be at least one. 
In other words, you cannot create an order without a customer and an order cannot belong to more than one customer. For example, you place an order at Amazon, the order belongs to you and it doesn't belong to someone else because it's your order. That's the mandatory one. This down here is the many. It's known as the crow's foot. Right, so you see like three little toes, the crow's foot. That means many. In other words, there's at least one, but there may be more than one. So if it's one line and the crow's foot, this says it, there has to be at least one. So an order must have at least one order line, but they may have multiple things. So it's like you go to the grocery store and you go up to the cash register and are they going to process you if you have nothing to buy? They're going to ask you why you're in line. So when you process that first order and you add the first item, the order is now created once you scan that first item. The order must have at least one item for that to actually be a valid order. So, and they can have more than one. Obviously, you're not you're going to go to the store. Sometimes you buy one thing. Sometimes you'll buy you know an entire shopping cart's worth of groceries. So that's mandatory one to many. So there's at least one thing going through cash, and there's no upper limit. This would be one and only one. In other words, you're only ever allowed to buy one thing at a time. Um, I'm trying to think of an example in real life for you guys for that. Other than that order you're buying at the grocery store can only have one customer because you're the one paying for it. So imagine if you paid for it, but it belonged to you and to the, per the next person in line at the same. Actually, people do that all the time. But realistically, you paid for it, so it's your order. It doesn't go into their system as multiple customers. It goes as in as one customer. So that's the one-to-one. -one. An optional many means a customer can exist into the system. For example, at Amazon, you can register and not have placed any orders yet. You can create an account and you register, but you haven't bought anything yet. Therefore, at this point, it's still optional. You have no orders, but you exist as a customer. So as a customer, you have the option of even placing an order or not. Eventually, you'll place an order. Maybe. Who am I kidding? Everybody buys stuff from Amazon. So here's an example that a school may enroll many students or not enroll any students at all. So here's a quick little example of what one of those, the symbology looks like. So now we have two entities, school and student, and we have a relationship between them. A student, you know, uh, for a student to actually be a student, they must belong to a school, technically, right? And most times, I'm going to be careful when I word this, most times a student only ever belongs to one school, usually. You know, you're going to grade school, you're not in three different grade schools, you're going to the one grade school. And the school may choose to enroll or not enroll students. For example, they closed one of the local schools, so they stopped enrolling students. Last year, Putman, nearby, they shut down the school. They couldn't justify keeping it open. And so Putman was shut down. And the school is now enrolling zero students. However, they have the option to enroll students if they wanted to in there. So the school may enroll zero or more students because it'd be stupid to enroll only one student. Imagine if you had to have a school for every student. One student, one school. One student, one school. You get a lot of personal attention. You'd have a principal just for you. You know, you'd have a teacher for you. You know, you'd have a secretary just for you, a custodian just for you. Holy crap, you'd feel privileged. But notwithstanding, that's kind of stupid when you say it like that, right? So a school will enroll many students. They, of course, they can choose not to operate that year, so they'll have no zero or more students. So that's what this diagram is saying. So this is an important one to remember. This slide, so later on, you know, when you're trying to remember how to diagram stuff, this slide actually shows you fairly well how things are interconnected. So the next step is actually learning how to develop a diagram. And 
It's actually a 10 step process. And they are as follows. You identify the entities, sort of like you guys what did you did in lab three. You find the relationships, you draw a rough ERD, you fill in the cardinalities, define primary keys, and then you draw a key-based ERD, which at that point is basically you know, a logical diagram. You identify the attributes, you map them as needed, fully diagram it, check your results, and then rinse and repeat. Um, later on, you guys learn about the software development lifecycle, where you learn that you're never actually done with a project, ever. It, projects never actually end. They just keep coming back. They're like zombie projects. But they reach a certain point where everybody's fairly happy and they can live with it. But a lot of projects are cyclical where they keep adding features and adding features. So they do a bunch of development. It goes into testing. Testing passes. They go into release. Once it's in release, they start developing new features while support is happening. Then they do more debugging. And then they do more testing. And then it goes back into release. It's the cycle. Developing ERD is the same thing. There's a process and a cycle to it where you do it over and over and over again until pretty much everybody's happy. So hopefully you're following along the slides because I'm not reading this paragraph. Feel free to read it for yourself. Um, this is similar to what you experienced in lab three where you were given a paragraph and there's certain pieces of key information you need in it. Um, and you learn to extract stuff. Now, in the real world, you may not get a paragraph like this. You may end up having an interview with someone. So, you know, you got a client that's coming in. They want a project being developed. You have a sit down with them. And then you interview them. You start asking them questions. What are you after? You know, what's your important pieces of information? And you're going to sit there and scribble away like mad. Or if you do the smart thing, you put a recorder in the middle of the table and you just record the conversation so you can play it back and catch all the nuances. Or a video record even better, and then you can actually get the visual keys because sometimes they'll say things, but the face is not saying this is not matching what the lip, you know, the eyes aren't matching what the lips are saying. We all have that experience every once in a while. Yeah, I really like you. Right? You're the nicest person on earth. No. Right? Same thing happens when you're talking to clients. Clients lie. And the face will tell you a lot. The problem is when they give it to you in writing, there's no feedback, right? So, but learning how to do it in writing is almost identical to doing it via interview. It's just by interview, you get to drill down a little faster. So the first process is to work through the information and highlight words you think that correspond to entities. Same thing as you guys did in lab three. So we look in this, and what you want to do is you want to find basically find the nouns or the, the objects, and you only identify them once. If you see them more than once, you don't mark them down a second time. You just mark them the once. And in here, we had a company that has several departments. Each department has a supervisor and at least one employee. Suddenly, the next sentence just starts talking about employees and departments. So there's, it's still describing that, but it's not actually describing the objects. And it talks about how an employee must be assigned at least to a project, and the rest of it is just noise at this point in time. It's not noise totally, but there's no new words. There's no new objects or things. So after you've identified the things, you can create a matrix. Anybody who's ever played sports has experienced this, the grid, you know, teams A to C, uh, A to D, and then teams A to D, and you see the results of how everything inter interacts. And it's a relationship matrix. And in another case, it's like a games matrix, right? Round robin or whatever. And essentially everything you've identified, you can put in a matching grid. And then what you want to do is you're going to go back through the paragraph of text and or go back through the interview and start highlighting the connections between things. So if we went back through that paragraph, we could highlight certain things. Uh, for example, when we talk about department, a department has no relationship to the department, so you don't put anything in there. A department and an employee, well, the employee is assigned to a department, and technically the department's assigned to an employee, so is assigned. A department is run by a supervisor, and a supervisor runs a department, so there's the relationship between those two. And if you go through the paragraph, you'll notice there's never a relationship between department and project. 
Therefore, you wouldn't put anything in there. And then you start you know, going through it thing by thing. So an employee belongs to a department and he works on a project. And the supervisor runs a department. Apparently, the supervisor doesn't do anything but run a department. They have no other purpose in life other than running a department. And if you ask anybody who has supervisors, they'll agree. They don't do anything but run whatever they're supposed to be running, if they do it at all. And then a project uses an employee, which, you know, sounds a little rough. But in this case, you employees are, you know, corporate assets that you can use at will. It's just how life works. And you have this matrix. So suddenly now you know what is connected to what and how. So then you're going to actually, you could actually take the time to actually write it out as sentences so that, you know, then you can actually take this little block of text and present it to the customer and say, <coughs> a department is assigned an employee, a department is run by a supervisor, an employee belongs to a department, an employee works on a project, a supervisor runs a department, and a project uses an employee. So at this point, we've identified how everything's interconnected. We've identified all the objects. We identified how they're connected. So we have objects and relations. Objects are known as entities, and relationships, well, they're relationships. So then, what you're gonna do is you draw the initial rough EID, ERD. So ERDs, what we call a basic conceptual ERD has two symbols and a bunch of lines. There's a rectangle and a diamond. Not a lot of symbols to remember here. Two symbols. Uh, anybody here ever study logic gates or electrical systems? Yeah, you guys had a little few more former symbols in two, right? There's a bunch of symbols in logic gates and electrical systems. You know, you got, for the electrical, you got the resistors, and you got your switches, and you got your whatevers, right? So in an ERD, you've got two. Entities are rect rectangles, and diamonds are the relationships, and the lines connect the diamonds to the entities. So it would look like this. An employee works on a project. A department is run by a supervisor. Do you notice so far we don't have any cardinality happening? We don't have the rules of one to many, many to many, optional, required. What we'd worry at first is just how are things interconnected? A department is assigned an employee, got to continue with the ones we identified. So suddenly we have this. These are the relationships we identified in that matrix. So that all that matrix and all that text has been summarized as that. A department is run by a supervisor. The supervisor runs a department. If I get my mouse to come back from the dead here. Oh, come on. Come on, PowerPoint. There you go. A supervisor is run by a, a supervisor runs a department. The department's run by a supervisor. The department is assigned an employee. The employee is assigned to a department. The employee works on a project. Well, the project doesn't work on the employee, but you know, you get the point. So that's the, the initial rough ERD. This, di the initial diagram, you could actually sit down with a client and say, does this make sense to you? At this point, you don't have any extra symbols on there. You have nothing else, but it's just basic concepts, entities, that at least they should be able to understand. That way, you should sit down with them and make sure you actually understand the ground rules properly right off the bat. That's the important part. So then you start filling in the cardinality. And if you go back to the paragraph, you'll have, you know that each department has one supervisor. A department is supervised, each supervisor the supervises one department. So that means one to one between the supervisor and the department. Each employee can belong to one or more departments. Now, for example, if you work for the government, you belong to one department. If you work for a small private company, you'll probably belong to more than one department, right? I belong to IT, I belong to the web development group, I, I belong to the customer planning group. I wear a lot of hats, a lot of variety through the day. But, you know, uh, I also do with project scoping and stuff like that. So, you know, I belong to several departments. So I belong to tech, I don't belong to tech support. <laughs> But I belong to engineering, I deal with OEM sales, 
and I deal with internal IT. So I belong to three departments. If you work for the government, you belong to one department because the government doesn't like sharing employees with more than one department because it reduces their head count. An employee, each department must have one or more employees. So a department must have an employee. If there's no employees, is it a department? It's a virtual department. It doesn't exist. Each project must have one or more employees. Is it an active project if no one's actually working on it? No. An employee can have zero or more projects. For example, if the employee works in accounting, they may not have a project. If they work in, the, in engineering, they may have many projects. Right? Depending on where you work, you may or may not have any projects. Accounts are receivable and accounts payable are not projects. Those are job descriptions. So, of course, this slide sucks. Uh, we got a little bit of uh, contrast issues here. Um, but we've already shown you the thing. Yeah? Uh, can have versus must have. Can have means it's optional. Must have means it's mandatory. Um, so each employee can belong to more one or more department. That means the employee can can belong. In other words, um, when you say one or more, they must belong to at least one, but they can have more than one. Uh, each project must have one or more employees. In other words, a project cannot exist at least unless there's at least one employee. An employee can have zero or more projects. That means literally at this point, it just verbally written in English, it, you know, you can't say the employee must have zero or more because it doesn't flow right. It's an English thing. English is stupid. Take it as a, fr as a person who's French, English is stupid. So we already covered the cardinality examples. I'm going to skip this slide. So if I throw in the cardinality based on what was in the paragraph, you'll see that each department is run by a supervisor. A supervisor runs a department. A person is not a supervisor unless they're running a department. So they m must have at least one department and they can only run one department. A department must have a supervisor. And they can only have, theoretically, at least according to the paragraph of text, one supervisor per department. Again, we go back down and look at the employee and the projects. A project can be worked on by many employees, and it must have at least one employee to be a valid active project. An employee can work on zero or more projects. Now, why would an employee have no projects? They, maybe they're in a department that doesn't have projects. Maybe they're on vacation and they're not working on anything. You know, maybe they've been given a, a mental, mental health leave and they decide to go to Jamaica for three weeks. So they're not working on anything, right? And they finished everything. And they're just sitting in their office watching anime and playing video games. That's never happened to me. Ever. Um, I wish I was joking. <laughs> That's when I'm waiting for decisions to come down from above and there's nothing to do. The joy of having an office with a door. So a department and employees. A department is assigned to an em is assigned an employee, and a department must have at least one employee, and each employee must belong to a department. They can belong to more than one department, and each department can have more than one employee. But again, a department must have an employee to be a department, and an employee must belong to at least one department. So that's what this is saying. That's what these symbols mean. Now, the next step is if we were to go back through at this point, we're just, this right now is what they call a basic conceptual diagram. It covers the relationship, the entities, and the rules of engagement between the entities. So how many, which are required, that kind of thing. Uh, so when, so for example, later on, when you do your first assignment, and I ask you for a basic ERD, diagram, the conceptual diagram. This is this, that is a, well, I don't know why I keep pointing at my screen. That is what I'm after. That's a basic. Now we're going to expand upon the basic and make it what they call an extended um, or an enhanced, depending on what you want to call the E. So it would be an EERD. The E is enhanced or expanded or, you know, whatever. At that point, we start throwing in attributes. And the very first important attribute is always the primary keys.
And if we were to go back and look at the paragraph, we know that the supervisor is identified by a supervisor number. A department has a name. An employee has an employee number and the project has a project number. It's actually in the paragraph and explained. And it actually tells you that an employee is identified by their employee number. So you'll notice now we, we threw in a new symbol we didn't talk about yet. It's the circle or the oval. The, depending on who you want to talk, sometimes you use circles, sometimes you use ovals. But essentially a rounded object that has no corners. Usually the oval makes the most sense because it'll hold the most text compared to a circle. The oval stands for attribute. So attributes are the things that help to describe an object or an entity. And if the text in the oval is underlined, it's a primary key. In a few slides, you'll see what it looks like with, with when there's no primary keys attached. But at this point, we identified what the primary keys were based on the paragraph. And that's a <coughs> the holiest wall of text ever. Um, so what you're going to do is you're trying to try to identify attributes. So we already know what the primary keys are. So we go back through the paragraph and we try to match and name all the attributes that are essential to the system. And at first you don't try to match them to specific entities. So you're going to go through the paragraph and basically just start highlighting everything that sounds like a description of something. An employee's name, the department's name, blah, 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 blah. So then you go through and you cross out anything that's not going to go into the new system. Now, that doesn't happen very much as much as it used to happen. Um, what this is talking about is often dealing with legacy systems where you have really old computer systems and or really old processes and you're bringing them into the modern age. And when you're bringing them into the modern age, sometimes there's stuff you just don't want to bring across. Actually, I, I got to be careful when I say that because I'm in the middle of getting ready to migrate our uh, customer tracking system at work, our CRM, from one platform to the other. And there's stuff we don't want to bring across. So when I'm going through the old system, I'm going to identify things we don't want to bring, bring across because why bring data across you don't need? And so what happens is um, there's extraneous items. You, want, you don't want to bring across signatures, uh, things that never change, like the name of the company or the company's address, that's just noise. Um, anything you have left on there are probably attributes. So then after you've identified all your attributes, you wanna sit down with the stakeholders. Stakeholders are the people that are actually gonna be using your system at some point. And you say, okay, this is what I've identified. Any of these you don't need. And then they'll tell you, yeah, we don't use this anymore. We don't use that anymore. And they're gonna say, well, you're missing this, this, and this. And you might've accidentally nuked them because you thought they weren't important. Always double check with your stake stakeholders before you keep designing because you're gonna have a bad time if you didn't. So now, in the paragraph itself, the only thing that were indicated were the name of the department, the projects, uh, and uh, the name of the supervisor and the employees and their applicable numbers. So what you do then is you map the attributes. So then you need to match each attribute you identified with one entity and only one entity. For example, a student will have a name. So that'd be something you identified as a student name. Would you apply a student name to a teacher? No, because I'm not a student. I'm a teacher. Therefore, student name doesn't apply to me. It applies to you guys. And professor's name applies to me. Um, sometimes it may belong to more than one entity. So for example, a name. So then you may need to add a modifier to the attribute, such as customer name, employee name, blah, blah, blah. So you best describe it. Um, then sometimes you'll have attributes that are left over that you can't seem to figure out where they're connected. Um, so then you want to go figure out maybe if you have these leftover attributes that maybe you missed an entity somewhere along the way. So you got these extra pieces of data floating around and you have no idea where they're coming from and why they're there. Maybe you missed a source of data. So maybe you should go back and review your data, your data, your original process. Make sure you didn't miss anything. So, for example, we had in the paragraph. There's a department name. We know it belongs to the department. There's an employee number. We know it belongs to the employee. There's an employee name. We know it belongs to the employee. Same thing with the supervisor's number and name, and then the project name and number. Those are they belong to each other specific entities. 
which this becomes really hard to read. So if you actually have the slideshow down on your machine, it's a lot easier to read. Uh, the projector in here is actually really low resolution. So it's actually scaling this terribly. Um, but now you can see, if you look at, there's two things that have happened in this diagram. We resolved two different things. One, we mapped out all the attributes. So if we look at the supervisor, you'll see that the supervisor has a name and a number. So this belongs to the supervisor. The department only has a name because that's all that was described. The employee has a name and a number. The project has a project number. Now, what we had a couple of slides ago is, oh, come on. Over here, we have a many-to-many -many relationship, and here we have a many-to-many -many relationship. Remember I, just, I said many, many relationships cannot exist in a modern database system. It's something that's really not supported. You can't do many to many. So what happened is, as part of the step when we added the attributes, we also resolved the many to many relationships. And the many to many relationships, you resolve them by creating something called an associative entity. And actually I'll be talking about that in the physical design a bit later. But basically an associative entity is an extra entity you create to connect, to get rid of the many to many. So as I had one prof once did the hand gestures to explain this. When you have a many-to-many -many relationship, it looks like this, right? You've got a line with lines of both, like with the crow's feet at both end. When you actually resolve it to an, an associative entity, it ends up coming out looking like this, where the, the crow's feet are both pointing at the same table, but at the other end, it's a one-to-one. -one. So instead of going many-to-many, -many, you have one-to-many, one-to-many pointing to a third table. So the way you resolve many-to-many -many relationships is creating a third table, and it's known as an associative entity. And the associative entity will have the primary keys from the, from the parent tables. So if you were to look at the employee department, we know that the department name is the primary key on this one and that the employee number is the primary key over here. So the employee department, although they put it in a single bubble, this is a compound key. Department name plus employee number identifies the relationship between the two. And that is an associative entity. Again, down here, same deal with the employee project. We went from employee project down to employees and projects pointing to a third table that maps the relationships. So once you've reached this point, uh, there's a good chance you're probably not going to show this to a client. Or if you are showing it to a client, there's going to be a client that's slightly more technically capable than the average. Most times when you start doing the initial handshaking with a client, you're more dealing with, you know, their project planner and your project planner, and then the project planner and you have a chat, and then you come up some diagrams. They show the basic diagram to this guy. Suddenly this guy realizes he doesn't understand what's happening anymore, so he calls in his technical expert. At this point, you're going to be showing these kinds of diagrams to each other so that you're all talking the same language. So what happens is, once you've reached this point, you want to look at your diagram for the point of a system owner or user. In other words, you want to put yourself in the other person's shoes. You want to look at it and see, does it actually make sense? Is it something that's understandable? Then you want to go through cardinality pairs, make sure there's nothing stupid, like you didn't leave behind any many-to-manys, or you don't have any cases where you actually make things mandatory when it's impossible for it to be mandatory. Um, that kind of thing. And you want to double-check your diagram compared to the documentation. Make sure you haven't lost any attributes. Because the worst thing you can do during database design process is losing data. You don't want to JPEG your data. JPEG's lossy. Every time you, you play with it, it gets recompressed and you lose information. As opposed to non-lossy formats like bitmaps. You want it to be non-lossy. Therefore, by the time you're done diagramming, everything you've identified with the other party or your team, if you're working on an internal project, Everything that's been identified has been mapped. Everything is there. You haven't lost anything. So then what happens is you want to convert to a physical diagram. Um, in actual fact, the start of the next week's lecture is this, and I th this went really fast, so I'll probably do the first half of next week's lecture, which will make next week's lecture shorter, which is good for everyone. 
um, the steps are as follows. You take all the entities and convert them to something called tables. Woo. All single valid attributes become columns. Key attributes become primary keys. multi valued attributes become tables. These are like list of skills. Composite attributes are broken up into separate columns. You ignore derived attributes and you start assigning data types. Um, so I'm just going to open up the next one. If anybody needs to go take a drink of water or a tinkle, I'll give you guys 10 minutes if you need a stretch. Okay, so I'm doing the start of the second of next week's lecture, which is the rest of the physical design. Um, and at this point, this will cover, you know, data types and that kind of stuff so that you start to have an idea of what physically database designs look like, or they do. You guys have been working with physical designs already when you were using PG Modeler doing Lab 2. You know, in Lab 2 when it talks about doing reference tables and stuff. So, the, one of the first things you, you hit when you start doing physical designs is data types. So far, did you notice this whole term, I didn't talk once about data types? Right, we're on week four. Third lecture, I never said the word really. I've mentioned data types on the way by, but I never actually talked about them. Data types are important. You guys are learning Java, so you should know all about how sensitive data types can be. So when you're choosing your data types, in database, choosing your data type is a much more um, precise operation than it is, say, in Java or C. Uh, because in Java, you can say this is a string, and that's it, you're done. It holds text. There's no limit on the string itself. With databases, there's limits. You actually enforce limits. So one of the first things you look at is you go, how big is this data? Is it a number? Does it have decimal places? That kind of stuff, right? Like, which is the second one. Is it numerical data? Does it have decimal places? What not? Um, if it's a date... Do you notice I'm down saying should you or should you not include the time? If you see a date somewhere, always include the time. Can anybody take a guess why you should always include the time even though it looks like it's only a date? Eh? Shits and giggles? Uh, yeah, yes and no. There's actual logic behind why you should do it. Not necessarily. Want to take another guess? Now, th that's actually a special data type in databases. There's actual, actual stuff for date time. Here's why whenever you see a date, you always include the time. When you display something to a user, you can always hide the time part. So let's just say originally you created an ordering system. It's a legacy system. And they said, we only care about what day the order was placed on. Great. So, you know, this system's been running for six months and you're just tracking the date. So, you know, on January 3rd, we placed 36 orders. January 4th, there's 25 orders. And then suddenly, somebody marketing goes, what time of day do we get the most orders at? Well, I don't know. I was just tracking dates. I don't know anything about the time. On the other hand, if you were actually tracking the time at the same time, you can just go, hang on, I'll get that for you. You cannot invent data. You don't know when the order was placed if you didn't include the time. You know the day, but you don't know the moment. Therefore, it's better to track a little extra information than not track enough because it may come back and bite you in the ass later. Therefore, when you're planning your data types, if you see a date, always include the time because that way you're covered, it's CYA. For those of you that don't know what CYA stands for, it means cover your assets. <laughs> right? The next one is how big is the text? So if you're dealing with strings, like you guys in Java have probably hopefully by now learned what a string is. It's a variable that holds text and numbers, woo! Believe it or not, databases can hold text and numbers too. But the thing is, is they've created 
spe specialized data types where there's a limit to how big the string can be unless you pick another kind that doesn't have a limit. It's done for performance reasons. And then at the last line, there's something called blobs, and I just say no. Blobs are evil. They have very limited use cases. Um, rarely should you ever use these. Uh, at one point in time, people thought they were the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then one day they realized their backups are, were in the size of terabytes. Blobs are binary large objects, also known as data files. There are database servers that allow you to actually store binary data right in the database. So, for example, you could have a database that contains a list of songs you've downloaded. Man, I'm aging myself. This is pre-Spotify. But there once was a time when we sucked down music from wherever we sucked down our music from. <clears throat> you know, pick your favorite towards site. Right? We'd suck down the music, and after a while it got out of control. Maybe you wanted to keep track. Or even getting even older, we had our CDs or our cassette tapes. Vinyl never went out of style, so I'm not even going to talk about vinyl. But you got your CDs, and we used to actually have, you know, some of us that had really big libraries. I didn't, but one of my friends was insane, the amount of music he owned. He got to the point where he lost track. He actually bought software for his old computer to keep track of all the music he has. So he knew what he had in his library. If he needed to go look something up, he could actually find out if he actually had it. That's how bad it was. So somebody thought it was a great idea you could take the songs and actually store them physically in the database. So you could have actually a database that identifies where the, what songs you have. The database might be, you know, a couple of megs. Now imagine that every single record that talks about a song actually contains the song. And a, a well-encoded MP3 file is, you know, three to four megs, five megs each. Suddenly, instead of being a 500K database to a three meg database, every single row is three megs. And you have 10,000 songs in your library. So you go 10,000 times three megs, you know, you're talking about gigabytes of data for your library. Which one do you think takes the longest to back up? Big data, which one's gonna use up tons of disk space? The, the ones that have the binaries, just say no to blobs. It's that simple. There's better ways of handling blobs. I'll actually talk about those later as applicable. So I'm gonna go through the basic data types. Now these data types exist in pretty much every database server, roughly called this. Unless you're Oracle, then you're special. They've done some weird things in Oracle land. Um, however, the types are as follows. Character, often shortened to car, C-H-A-R. And you'll notice that there's a bracket N next to it. Character is a fixed length string and it's space padded. So if you define a field be character 10 and you put in AB, it will actually pad the rest with spaces. So it always occupies 10 bytes. It will always occupy 10 slots on your database, no matter what. This is the, one of the original, what you'd call um, primitive data types, was one of the first they created for database servers. And it had a really good place in, in the world because once upon a time, hard drives were really slow. Tape to tape was even slower. And you needed to know exactly how far to move the head to the get to the next piece of data. So if you knew it was exactly 10 characters long, you knew you needed to move so many millimeters to get to the next piece of information. So, which was fine. Then suddenly, you know, hard drives showed up to the party where we had tons of space. Yes? No, it's not. Yeah. Not necessarily, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. Which I was lead you, you, you jumped my story. Yeah. So we along came hard drives. We had these massive hard drives, like 20 megabytes. They were about that big. 
I wish I was kidding. Like, you know, I remember the first hard drive I ever saw in my life was connected to System 36, and it was that big. I was, like, taking a tour of the mill when I was, like, 10 years old. It was the first hard drive, real hard drive. You could actually see the platters turn. It was cool. Um, 20 megabytes compared to the each tape, which held, like, a megabyte. That was lots of room. So, but they realized now with the hard drives that the heads had moved really fast compared to the tape that we didn't need to worry about fixed length stuff so that we knew exactly how millimeter, millimeters to move because we don't actually know where anything is on the disk, right? Because the disk manages where it puts its data itself. So they just said, hey, we'll create something called variable length strings, known as a varchar or a character varying, which database server you're using. And in Oracle, it's called varchar2 because varchar is reserved and not used. It's special that way. And what this is, is you define a string, it has a maximum length, but it only occupies the amount of characters inside that string plus a terminator bit. So you'll have all the bytes for each of the letters or the numbers or the characters you have in your string. And then there's this tiny little extra little bit that's been plugged to the end. If you can think of it, you can visualize the extra little bit being almost like a bookend. You know, you've got a shelf and you've got to hold your books on. And as you take a book off, everything's kind of loose, so you just push it over, and the bookend keeps marking off where the end of your books are. Same thing. Every database server does this a little bit differently. So I'm not going to say, you know, Postgres uses four bytes, MySQL uses three, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? All you need to know is it's a maximum length, but it only occupies, realistically, the number of characters contained in it. So if the first one's a character 10, it'll occupy 10. A varchar 10, and you put in the letters A, B, it'll be... A, B, plus some magic little character that the database server knows means it's the end of that field. And then the rest of the data continues from there. Now, there once was a time where a character had a massive performance advantage over Varkar. Nowadays, for example, in Postgres, the developers of Postgres recommend you use Varkar because they've actually optimized it so much that Varkar is actually faster than Car now. There once was a time where a character had an advantage. There was a reason you'd use it. For example, postal codes in Canada are always six characters long. Unless you want to do the space, then it's seven. It's always six characters long. There'd be an advantage to use a car six because it knew always exactly how big each of the strings were. Now you could use a var car six and only contain the first three and it'd be just as fast. No big advantage. Booleans. Booleans store true-false values. However, Booleans and database servers are what you'd call a trinary Boolean. A Boolean in a database actually has three states. Yes, no, I don't know. Also known as null. Right? Yes is true. No is false. Null means I don't know. So good database servers actually offer you a proper Boolean data type. Database servers like MySQL doesn't have a Boolean type. They use a tiny int. It stores the values between 0 and 9. So you got yes. Actually, values 0, 9 plus null. So you got I don't know, no, yes, and a various shades of yes. Most people ignore everything past 1. Everything after 1 is like your significant other. Notice I'm not even applying you know, male or female on this one. It's like, do you like this shirt? Uh, they're never going to give you yes, no answer. If they're smart, they will, but they may not. So, but MySQL does not actually have a true Boolean. It actually uses an integer, and you flip between null, zero, and one, and then you can ma get magical and push it past one. Then there's a few different kinds of integers. There's a small integer, a, a normal integer, and a big init. Uh, big int, not all database servers offer big int. Postgres offers a big int. It's a precision of 19. 19 digits of precision. Um, I don't remember if I actually have it in this slide what the maximum number is in Postgres, but it's a really big friggin' number. Um, then there's decimals and numerics. They're the same thing. Some servers call it decimal, some call it numeric, and Postgres offers both, but they're essentially, they're, they're exactly the same thing. They're aliases of each other. And the way it works is 
there's the precision. Depending on the server, they'll call that uh, the size. And the second one will be the scale. And the instead of scale, they call it precision. For example, a decimal 5, 2 means it is a number that is a total of five digits. Three are before the decimal place, two are after the decimal place. So total, so you know, you got three before the decimal place. Hang on, I got to flip this. Three before the decimal place, two after the decimal place. How many fingers am I holding up? Five. But it's a three, it's five comma two. So one, two for reserved, the precision, or the scale, depending on how you want to look at it. And the, first, the, the next, the rest of the digits come after, uh, come before the decimal place. Yes? No. No. The SQL language itself is not case sensitive, but the, depending on the database server, the object names are. SQL special that way. All right. I'm actually, I'm supposed to say basic data types two, but still basic data types one. You have floats. Yay for all you guys. We also have reals and double precisions. If you really need a lot of decimal places, you guys probably have experienced floats and reals or whatever you want to call them in Java. Same deal. Um, you also have dates, which store year, month, and day. You have time, which stores hour, minute, and seconds. You have a timestamp. Now, depending on the database server, they're not always called timestamp. Sometimes they're called date time for obvious reason because it contains both. For example, in MySQL, they have date time and timestamp. Timestamp is a special version of date time. You can only have one timestamp field per database, per table, I mean. You have as many date times as you want. Postgres calls it timestamp. It is the year, month, day, hour, minute, seconds. And the Postgres, by the way, will go to uh, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000. A millionth of a second of precision. So if you're really curious, that's why Postgres is very really popular in scientific applications because it's precise to that fast. Um, they have intervals, which are cool. Intervals is, it's actually integer fields. What it contains is the amount of time between events. So for example, if you stored the start time, the start timestamp, so whatever it is now, 713, and I see interval insert number here, it'll actually tell me how much time sp has spent since the start. It, doesn't, it never doesn't track when anything started, doesn't track when anything ended, it only tracks how long something took. Which is really good, again, for scientific applications because sometimes they only care about how long something took. They don't really care about when each test started. They want to know how long each test took. So those are the basic data types. Postgres has tons of other data types. Every database server has its own series of flavors of data types. Uh, if you're really curious, you could bump over to the Postgres site and start looking up their data types. Uh, they have GIS data types. If you don't know what GIS is, it's geographical information systems. It actually understands like coordinates on a map, X, Y, Z. Now, it's actually got geometric data types. In other words, it actually knows what a circle is. So instead of actually storing a circle and all the points of the circle, it'll store X, Y, R. So it'll tell you this circle is at these coordinates and this is the radius of the circle. Uh, so you can actually do math and, and actually extract which ones, which circles are bigger than others or which circles are more to the left than a certain circle. Uh, it has network types, so IPv4, IPv6, MAC addresses, and you can actually sub-search. Uh, we now, they now brought in XML data types. They've brought in, uh, uh, what else do we have? Uh, JSON data types, because you know, all the NoSQL guys like MongoDB said, we're cool. Postgres said, ha, 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 I can do that too. And I can do it better than you, faster than you, and still use SQL to make it happen. Um, they, they got tons of data types, like crazy amounts of data types. All right, so field design. This actually kind of applies to lab four. So that's why I'm kind of, I'm, I want to get through this today. It'll help you guys a bit with lab four. Field design number one, make your field names meaningful. In other words, if somebody else comes in behind you, 
and then you look at your database structure, they're not going to put out a hit on you. They're not going to hit you. They're going to read your database structure and actually make sense. It understands. They look at a customer's table. They have a field called first name and a field called last name. Uh, I wonder what goes into those fields. The name of their dog? No, it's their first name and their last name. If all you had was N1, N2, it's not meaningful because you have no idea what that means. Name one, name two. Depending what part of the world you come from, N1 and N2 mean two different things. Go to Japan. What's the first version of their name? They always say last name, first name. Here it's first name, last name. N1, N2 has different meanings depending where you are in the world. Therefore, use meaningful names. Find, pick a naming convention and stick to it. Odds are if you're just getting hired out of school, they'll have a naming convention. They're going to give it to you and you follow the rules. If there's nothing quite like doing a code review and they look at you and go, what the heck have you been doing? I've been there at the other end of the code review. After I changed jobs and I had to change naming conventions, it was a little rough after doing it one way for 10 years. So follow it. Um, you try to make an informed guess of the maximum size the data is going to be. So, for example, if you're going to take a guess at the maximum size for a postal code, in Canada, you could easily go with six or seven. An American postal code, also known as zip code, how much space do you need for one of those? Eh? Yeah, they're up to nine. Actually, ten technically, you've got to include the dash. Once upon a time, it was five, and then somebody realized it was stupid. Five numbers, no, no letters. And then they ran out of postal codes. So they literally had one postal code for half of Manhattan. So then they literally had humans sorting the mail to figure out street by street where the mail was going. So suddenly somebody says, well, this is dumb. We're going to create sub-postal codes. So then you got like, you know, five digits dash, four digits. And that's a substation. So suddenly it gets routed to another station where it gets sorted out, just like they do here, where all the mail for certain areas is given to the postman. The postman actually sorts their mail. Actually, nowadays, it's actually most of the system will source it for them too, but there once was a time when this, the postman would get a bag of mail and then he'd sort it before his delivery. That was part of their job. And, but that's basically what they do now. Um, and then when you have relationships, uh, in this case, you probably want to, you know, if you're doing a foreign key, you want to follow in an appropriate manner, not call it FK1, FK2, FK3. Because again, to guarantee the person behind you will see FU1, FU2, FU3, as opposed to FK1. You literally follow a, a decent naming convention. So if you're, the parent table is users, maybe you want to call it user ID, like I described last week. That way it makes sense to whoever reads it. Now, I explained last week to try to keep things lowercase. Why? Because lowercase works everywhere. Some database servers are case sensitive to the object names. Some aren't. Lowercase, at least you know, is going to work everywhere. Um, don't ever use spaces. Even if they let you do it, you shouldn't do it. Why? Because you're going to make somebody's life harder later. SQL. Once you learn SQL, uses spaces, delimiters between keywords. And therefore, if you've got spaces, it thinks you're, you're now putting in a delimiter. And every database server escapes those spaces differently. It's like one of those things, like if Microsoft lets you do it, should you do it? No. So instead of spaces, you underscores. I already had this conversation. And the other ticket is stick to the most basic data types whenever possible. Honestly, there's not always a lot of reasons to use the fancy data types unless you're creating a special purpose database. Again, if you're doing a geographic mapping database, like the guys up on the third floor of T-Building, you may have noticed the guys walking around in their military uniforms. They're the ones in the military GIS program. They're learning how to actually you know, map battlefields so that they can actually have proper tactical maps. And they're actually using Postgres for that course, by the way. Um, you know, that's special purpose. It has, you use those data types. But for almost everything else, you want to stick to basic data types. Anyone want to take a guess why you should stick to the most basic data types as much as possible? That's one. 
No, not always. Sometimes the sometimes the basic ones actually use up more memory. Y sort of, but you're missing the most important one. Portability. Right? Let's say you start out your project on MySQL. I pity you if you did, but you know, if you started on MySQL. Suddenly your project has blown up and it just, whatever it is you're selling is selling like hotcakes and your MySQL server is shitting the bed three times a day because it can't cope with the load. You suddenly say, well, I need to migrate to something else. If you used all the most basic data types or as close as you can for that particular server, you can probably extract the database structure, do a few minor changes and port it to whatever your next platform is going to be. You know, in Postgres, the, the biggest, uh, the two biggest differences between Postgres and MySQL is the primary key data types are slightly different, but there's ways around that fairly easily. And there's no Booleans in MySQL. And the text type is broken in MySQL, but it's not broken in Postgres. Which in MySQL, you got three kinds of text types, small, medium, and large. In Postgres, you got text. In Postgres, the text field can actually occupy gigabytes of data. So there's no upper limit on it. That's literally, you're limited by how much disk space you have. Um, so if you stick to the basic data types, you'll be able to port it more easily. That's why you want to stick to the basic data types because you might be porting something that doesn't support the same ones. <clears throat> but then again, if you have very specific use cases, odds are whatever you're porting to will probably support something similar because you actually need that there. And odds are you're not going to be downgrading, you're going to be upgrading. So almost nobody goes from Postgres to MySQL. Nobody goes from Oracle to MySQL or Oracle to Access. They might go to something comparable, Oracle to Microsoft SQL Server or DB2, Oracle to Postgres, but you'd go from Postgres to those guys also. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to map uh, data types to fields. So again, you start thinking about how long does the field need to be, you know. Do you need 255 characters to store a person's first name? No. Should you use 255 characters to store the person's first name? There's no reason you couldn't. However, in a few moments, I'll explain why you should actually limit. Uh, you should think, should I plan for slightly larger data? And I actually have a story on that, which I'll tell also in a moment. Is the data text numeric date or time of some sort? If you're looking at numbers, you look to see if they have decimal places. How many decimal places do I need to worry about? For example, when you're dealing with financials, how many decimal places should you keep? Anybody want to take a guess? Most people will usually give me one answer and they're wrong. So if you're going to say two, you're wrong. Usually three or four. Why? Especially if you're dealing with financials that have to do with exchange rates. Often you'll have half and quarter pennies. Although it doesn't sound like much, once you add up all those half and quarter pennies at the end of the month, especially if you're you know, doing a turnover of a million or two a month, all those half and quarter pennies will actually add up to a significant sum of money. You know, there's that old uh, urban legend, you know, the guy who was skimming off the half pennies into another account? No, but uh, that, they did it in a Superman movie, yes, because it actually is based on a true story but it became an urban legend. It was never as big as, the guy did not pull up suddenly in a, in a Ferrari to work, but they did catch the fact that you know, there was a check being cashed every three months for a couple thousand dollars. And they were wondering what this check was coming from. Yes, those extra decimal places count. So when you're dealing with money, extra place. Um, you know, can the number be negative? In Postgres, it doesn't care. In MySQL, you can actually have unsigned data types. So if it can't be negative, why waste the space? Uh, how big can the number get? In other words, you're going to pick the right data type. Um, when looking at date and times, do you need to store both the date and the time? The answer is yes, always yes. Uh, the, rarely is there a case you don't need to store the time. One of the few cases is date of birth. Rare, does, do you think the school cares what time of day you were born? Do you actually know what time of day you were born? How many people in this room actually know what time of day they were born? Yeah, the rest of us don't care. So, yeah. So, now, the reason why you want to limit the size of your fields is as follows. 
Um, some programming frameworks or programming languages or uh, design tools actually read the structure of the database and actually set basic limits on how big the fields are going to be. Do you ever go to a web page where you can only type like 25 letters and then it stops letting you type? That's because the database only allows 25 characters in that field. Therefore, they're actually <coughs> structuring the data based, the UI based on what's in the database. And again, if you don't need 255 characters, design it so you don't need it. it it's just more, it's going to sound stupid when I say it's visually pleasing as a, design, as, a data, as a person programming against a database to actually have hard limits. That's just all it is. Now, do I need to plan for slightly larger data? The answer is always yes. Um, next week, if time permits, I'll actually start talking about actually some basic design patterns that you see. I don't have a slideshow for that because I do it all on the board. Um, but I do have a story on this one. Uh, when I got my second job out of school, well, third job out of school, when I first moved to Ottawa. So that was a few years ago, 1997-ish. Yeah, 1997 sounds about right. I was working for a company called Digital at the time. I know, how many of you here have heard about Digital Equipment Corporation? Oh, I feel old. Compaq. HP. Okay, Compaq bought Digital Equipment, which merged with HP. They're all the same company. Back then, they were separate entities. Well, I took over this one project, and it was a call tracking system for a specific unit of the organization. They handled calls. So if Digital sold 500 PCs to an organization, they offered so many hours of free tech support a week on their top five applications. I can't see, and there's no reason to be passive aggressive. I can't make eye contact. Um, anyways, um, so for example, the Ottawa Hospital bought 2,500 PCs. Like, literally, this is the truth. They bought 2,500 PCs from Compaq. They were given, I think, 15 hours a week of free tech support on their top five desktop applications. So they got like free support from uh, for for the office suite um, and a few other things. So if somebody had a problem with Word, they picked up the phone, dialed an extension, and they thought they were talking to someone at the auto hospital. They were actually calling a call center out in Gatineau. Sorry, Hull. That's before it got renamed to Gatineau. It's a few years ago, right? So they called the call center in Hell. I mean Hull. And then that's what we called it because we had to drive there every day. And it was like that. But one of our clients was the Department of the Government. And back then, the government was a little special. The Ontario government was really special with how they did their email addresses. Their email addresses was as follows. Full first name, dot, full last name. Doesn't sound that different from today. At the full department name, dash, the full department name in French, dot, O-N, dot, G-C. Okay, that doesn't sound that bad yet, right? But if you went Ministry of Transportation, Minister de Transportation, .gc, and actually that's not even the department I'm talking about. It was actually a longer na name than that. And before the at sign, you had the people with the hyphenated names. Now, the ones of us that are French know exactly what I'm talking about. This lady, which caused the discovery of the data was not big enough, the data space was not big enough, had a hyphenated first name and a hyphenated last name. So her first name wasn't like Marie Jose, it was like something Antoinette. So she had like nine letters dash 11 letters as her first name. Dot, and if, if you guys haven't noticed, I have a lot of the letters in my last name, not as bad as a Polish name, but you know, there's 11 letters if I remember it, my last name. Her last name, was Boudreau dash Boudreau. Now, for those that aren't French, don't know how many letters that is, that's an all, a lot of freaking letters. Her last name was 27 letters long. Okay, at this point, we're occupying over 50 characters for the person's name at, and after the at sign, there was another 55 characters. The email field could hold 75. 
We could never put her email address in the system. I had to patch the system to make it work. I actually had to edit the database, make the field bigger. And back then, you couldn't just make the field bigger. You actually had to create a new field, copy the data to it, rename the old field, rename the new field while nobody's allowed to use the system. And the computers were slow. This took more than like half a second. Now that's done. That's great. Then I had to patch the application because back then it wasn't web-based. It was a client desktop application written in Visual Basic, which was the program language of choice for desktop applications for database back then. Don't groan. It was actually better than everything else. It just, today you'd use C Sharp. This was the C Sharp of the 90s. But, no, couldn't do it. No, well, no, it's an email address. If I use just half your email address, is it going to get to you? Yeah, no, but that's not what the rule was at the government. Right? The, that was the naming conventions for their email addresses. Can you imagine how bad it was when you actually had to type out the whole person's email address? You had to get the business card for the person. There was actually a printing error because it actually went off the end of the business card because their name was so long. It was stupid. But that's an example. So do I plan for slightly larger data? The answer is always yes. Always give yourself an extra 20%. It's, that's fairly safe. You know, same thing if you end up with somebody with a Hispanic name. Any Hispanic students in here before I, I say this? I don't want to offend anyone. Actually, no, that's okay because usually they laugh as much as I do about it. I once had a student that came from Puerto Rico. He had six first names and a hyphenated last, and had two last names. Because apparently they always carried the previous father's name along for the ride. And being good Catholics, they also, their first name was always Joseph. Well, technically my first name is Joseph. Everybody baptized Catholic, will have Joseph as their first name, technically, at least as far as the church is concerned, not on your birth certificate, but as far as the church is concerned, your first name is Joseph. Congratulations. My father's name was Joseph Joseph. It was amazing. Jojo. I know he didn't have bizarre adventures. But, you know, so, again, a person's first name, in his case, there is no first name field in the world that could hold all his names. So, obviously, he only picked his most commonly used names. But, you know, there, sometimes you have to plan for a little more space. So if you're dealing with, you know, Hispanic, Hispanic countries where they have lots of big names, maybe you'll want to make those field names a little bit bigger so you can not offend them by making them have to pick which name their mother calls them. Again, back to the Puerto Rico student, it was amazing. No matter which of his first names I used, he responded. It was hilarious. And he goes, how, how, I go, how does it work so fast? He goes, I have no idea. When your mother spends 30 seconds calling out your name, you know you're in trouble. And I really, I'm not kidding. This guy was real. This was a real student years ago, but it was great fun. Okay, so resolving many-to-many -many relationships. We're almost done. Resolving many-to-many -many relationships. Remember earlier I talked about when I was talking about the, um, the basic ERDs? When you're creating associative entities, it's essentially you got the many-to-many you create a third table called an associative entity. And in that, it contains the primary keys of the two other tables. That's all that's in there. Nowadays, that's usually not enough. Um, why? Because we need to know when things happen. We need to know who did it. Auditing. So something now is called an associative entity with attributes. Yay, we gave it a bigger name. It is, again, the primary keys of the, the parent tables, plus other stuff. Dates, maybe prices, uh, who did it. Um, most IT systems nowadays can track who created it, when was it created, who modified it, when was it modified, who deleted it, and when was it deleted. We actually need to track that for auditing purposes, thanks to... Uh, Bernie Madoff, that name rings a bell for anybody in this room. Uh, people like that, we actually have to track so much detail now. Uh, people that, you know, um, alter records to make it suit like they're doing a good job. Let's go with that. We need to track that. Okay, so a many-to-many -many relationship. It's a new table. Boom. Uh, you create it as an associate entity, and then you're, that's it. You're done. Um, next week, I'm covering, covering this topic.
Just so you know, it's the topic I hate teaching the most. It sucks. It's life. And I'm also going to be talking about the first assignment next week. Again. And I'll be giving you guys examples of actual what the data structures you'd pick for specific kinds of data. Other than that, folks, that's the end for today. I will see you in lab.